Welcome guys and girls to another interview preparation video. In this lecture, we are going to go over some of the most commonly asked serverless interview questions along with the average common answer that most people will give as well as the answer that you should give to set you apart from the crowd. The questions we are going to cover are what is AWS Lambda? What are some of the other AWS serverless services? How to handle Lambda cold starts? Can you use your own container image with Lambda? How does Lambda scale? And how is it different than Fargate? How do you change the amount of CPU allocated to Lambda? How do you secure your Lambda function? Why use EventBridge when SQS is cheaper? Should I use serverless or Kubernetes? How can you migrate your existing APIs to Amazon API Gateway? How can you use API Gateway with Elastic Kubernetes Service and Elastic Container Service? Tell me a challenge you faced with serverless. This is a packed video, so I have provided timestamps for your viewing convenience. Let's get started. Question number one, what is AWS Lambda? Uh, so in reply to this question, everyone will say that uh, Lambda is a compute service from AWS, which lets you run your code without provisioning any server, either physical or virtual. Uh, but then you should add these things. You should say that uh, Lambda has four uh, main features. Number one, no servers to manage. Number two, Lambda scales automatically. You do not need to configure any auto scaling group. Number three, it is inherently highly available. So under the hood, Lambda is deployed into multiple availability zones. So even if one availability zone goes down, Lambda will still be up and running. And number four, pay as you use. So if your Lambda is not being used, you do not pay anything. Also add a couple of use cases in high level, such as a Lambda can be used in various use cases, such as API, uh, Alexa, bad jobs, etc. Question number two, what are some of the other AWS serverless services? Uh, so any serverless service in AWS should have the four properties I mentioned uh, for the first question, which is number one, no servers to manage, obviously, but people think that's the only criteria. But in addition to that, a serverless service, you do not need to configure any auto scaling. So it should scale automatically. Uh, then it should be inherently highly available and for a fourth property is uh, you should pay as you go. So some of the other AWS services that satisfies these four criteria are um, API Gateway, SQS, SNS, uh, S3, DynamoDB, etc. Question number three, which is very common, how to handle Lambda cold starts. So first of all, let's understand what is cold start. So I'm going to use my whiteboard to explain that. So by default, when you define your Lambda, uh, it's just, your code is just sitting, but no code is running yet. Uh, so when a invocation comes, what happens is a container spins up under the hood and then loads your code and then it starts running. So the time it takes between your Lambda getting invoked and the code actually starts running is termed as cold start. Uh, so there are a couple ways to uh, mitigate cold start. One, the easiest way is to utilize the new feature from AWS is provision concurrency. So provision concurrency, what it does is uh, when you create your Lambda uh, or afterwards, you can say that bring up specified number of these containers that comes up when Lambda gets invoked. But you pre warm them without any traffic. So basically, uh, let's say there is no traffic yet and you anticipate some big event coming up and then you just pre warm this bunch of containers underneath that Lambda uses and all these containers will have the Lambda code already loaded. And then when a traffic comes in, the Lambda does not need to spin up any containers because everything is already spun up. So the traffic will just go and start using the already pre-warmed containers. Uh, however, 
there is a cost associated with this provision concurrency. But a couple of things you can mention uh, to uh, optimize the cost is uh, you can schedule a provision concurrency. So you don't need to keep this, all these containers running all the time. Uh, so let's say uh, you have a, you are a retail customer or you, you are like a education customer, you know when big traffic gonna come in, when you, when you announce a discount or a test is going on. So based on that schedule, you can uh, pre-warm this provision concurrency. Another way to uh, configure provision concurrency is to auto-scaling. Uh, so you can say that uh, you, you spin up, let's say 10 of these uh, pre warm container, and if the utilization of this provision concurrency reaches 70%, uh, then you pre warm some more to keep the utilization at that level. So basically, uh, let's say uh, you pre warm 10 of these containers, and then eight of those containers is getting used, and the auto scale, what it will do is it will gonna spin up some more container, so the overall utilization stays at 70%. Another way to optimize cold start is to optimize the code itself. Cold start depends on how long it takes for the code to get uh, loaded. Uh, so the more lightweight your code is, so do not package anything unnecessary that you don't need to use into your code, the faster it will be. Now, another way to optimize cold start is to utilize the behavior of Lambda. Uh, so let's say traffic came to this container and then it's done, like the execution is done. So there is no traffic. Even though the execution is done, this container will stay warm or stay up for some time. So when the next traffic comes, it can reuse the container. And moreover, within the code, certain part of the code, you could specify that they don't need to get executed again for subsequent executions. Uh, so what could be some of the examples? So for example, your Lambda fetches some data from a database. So you have to establish a connection with your database or maybe your Lambda fetches some a parameter from Secrets Manager or Parameter Store. So it doesn't matter like how many times that code gets executed, it always gonna do the same thing. So for subsequent execution, you should not have to rerun those codes. So how you do it is, uh, so in your Lambda code, you have this handler and handler, handler takes two parameter event and context. Anything on top of the handler is the global section. So whatever code you put in, when another traffic comes, that code does not get executed. So let's say you should put database connection in the global section, let's say your Lambda does something with the S3. So for that, you are using Boto3 connections. So your uh, AWS Boto3s should be in the global section, including uh, Secrets Manager, if you are fetching something. So those are the three popular ways to manage your cold start for the Lambda. Can you use your own container image with Lambda? Uh, the answer is yes. So during the previous example, we were mentioning that AWS will provide the container image, but if you want, you can even uh, create this container image yourself and use that for your lambdas. Uh, so why, why should you do this? Because in this way, uh, you can reuse all the advantages of Lambda. Uh, because Lambda has way better integration with other AWS services than your uh, Kubernetes uh, services as well as pay as you go, highly available, all the advantages. However, if you have containerized your code uh, and you are, you are already running in uh, Kubernetes, the container will not work as is. You have to change a little bit so that this container can interact with the Lambda service. But it's not, it's not a, a crazy change, but you do have to change a little bit. So I have a separate video with demo on this, so please go check it out if interested. If you're liking this video, why not click that like button? Smash it if that's something you are into. Each of your like helps this video reach new viewers and helps this channel grow. 
Also, comment on this video. Let me know what other interview questions you want me to cover. Click the subscribe button and the bell icon if you are not already subscribed. All right, back to the next interview questions. So the next question, how does Lambda scale and how is it different than Fargate? So the Lambda scaling is pretty straightforward. Every traffic that comes in, every traffic connection creates a new instance of your Lambda. So one Lambda instance cannot handle more than one traffic connections. So each traffic will simply spin up a new instance for your Lambda function. How is it different than Fargate? So what Fargate does is, uh, Fargate spins up a container. So let's say this is a EKS Fargate. So basically this is running inside a pod, but this Fargate pod can handle more than one traffic connection. Uh, so this will handle multiple traffic connections, which is different than how Lambda works. Remember, one Lambda can only handle one traffic connections. And then you can specify the scaling criteria. You could say that if the CPU utilization of this pod goes above 70%, then spin up another Fargate. Uh, so let's say if this exceeds the CPU threshold, then another Fargate pod will come up and then the other traffics will start going to this pod. And as the execution is done, uh, the loads will reduce and if it goes below that threshold, uh, Fargate will remove the other pod. One thing to keep in mind is uh, if there are no traffic, there is no Lambda. Um, so if there are no traffic, all the traffic is gone. Eventually, after a certain amount of time, all the Lambdas will be gone and you are not going to pay for anything. Uh, but, but for your Fargate, even when there is no traffic, uh, one Fargate pod will keep on running. So you do have to pay a little bit uh, for that. But again, uh, it depends on case to case. You cannot deterministically say that Lambda is always cheaper than Fargate or Fargate is always more expensive or Fargate is cheaper. Uh, so for your application, do the calculation that how many Fargate you need to keep up and running, uh, how much will be the cost with Lambda and then come to the decision. And beyond that, uh, there are a couple other differences between Lambda and Fargate. So Lambda can run maximum 15 minutes uh, Fargate, there is no time limit. This Fargate pod can run as long as you want. Uh, the maximum Lambda memory is 10 gigabyte and maximum amount of CPU core is six. Uh, Fargate, a little bit different configuration. You have to pick and choose uh, between the CPU and memory. I'm gonna put it on the screen here. For Fargate, you can reuse your existing container if you're already running Kubernetes and you want to go to Fargate. You don't need to change the container image. It could be used as is with uh, Fargate. But with Lambda, if you want to use that container, you need to change a little bit. One superpower of Lambda is Lambda inherently integrates with uh, way more AWS services. For example, uh, every time you put something on your S3 bucket, you want to do some processing. Lambda integrates directly with S3. If you want to fire your Lambda from EventBridge, or uh, step functions or SQS, SNS, uh, all those are integrated out of the box with Lambda. With container, you, for some cases, you need to build the integration layers in between. Uh, so those are some of the uh, differences between Lambda and Fargate. Next question, how do you change the amount of CPU allocated to Lambda? This is a trick question. Uh, so for Lambda, only thing you can configure is memory. And as you increase the memory, it will get more CPU core. The maximum amount of memory you can allocate to a Lambda is 10 gigabyte and maximum amount of CPU core that, can, that it will allocate to that Lambda is six CPU core. Um, so if you need more CPU, if your workload is more CPU dependent, uh, you, can, you can just increase the memory and that's what it will give more CPU core. Uh, you can put a little piece of code to see how many CPU cores your Lambda has. Uh, I'll, I'll give it on the screen and you can run that and that's what's going to give you how many core it has. Next question. 
How do you secure your Lambda function? So this is a big topic, but I'll give you a couple of uh, answers for the interview. So let's say this is your Lambda function. So when it comes to security, the first two things are who can invoke this Lambda functions and what functions or what other AWS services can this Lambda function invoke? So the second part is very common. You, you folks probably know it. So let, let's say this Lambda should be allowed to fetch something from DynamoDB or S3. Uh, so this Lambda will have a AWS role attached, right? So I'm gonna call it role. And this role can specify what AWS services specifically, which bucket uh, can this Lambda code access? Now coming back to how, who can invoke this Lambda. So this part uh, people don't know. So ma make sure you mention this on your interview is Lambda resource policy. Lambda resource policy can control who can call your Lambda. So let's say you have two APIs, API one, and API 2, and you only want API 1 to call this Lambda, but not API 2. So you can set in the resource policy that, hey, only allow uh, invocation from API 1, but if API 2 wants to connect, then reject it. Now coming back to the actual code, um, so your, your code will have some uh, programming packages. And uh, we have a CVE list that gets published. CVE stands for uh, Common Vulnerability and Exposure. So let's say one package, for example, log4j or something, uh, suddenly becomes secure, uh, vulnerable. So you have to have a way to detect uh, if your Lambda has that package. So you can dynamically scan your Lambdas. Uh, using third-party tools like uh, Twistlock or currently uh, Prisma Cloud, Sneak, uh, Sysdig, etc. Uh, so your Lambda will be getting scanned dynamically. So I'm going to put a dynamic scan. And as soon as a vulnerability is detected, uh, you can shut down your Lambda, remediate it, uh, or alert someone and take the action. So those are, those are some ways you can secure your Lambda. Next question, why use EventBridge when SQS is cheaper? Um, so this is, a, this is a neat question because both SQS and EventBridge uh, helps you build event-driven architecture. So if system A wants to send some message to system B, both EventBridge and SQS can do that. But what EventBridge does that SQS does not do is uh, rule-based uh, target invocation me and message transformation and archive and replay. Uh, so I'll explain a little bit. Let's say you are an insurance company and uh, you want to send some messages from system A to B and uh, there is a field in the message, Let's what type of insurance it is. Maybe home insurance, car insurance, etc. And depending on the type of insurance, you want to invoke different Lambda functions in the backend. But there is no straightforward way to do that with SQS because SQS cannot see the inside of your message. So all you could do is basically you have to have like a common Lambda and this Lambda needs to check the type and then invoke other Lambdas. Event bridge. So if we have the same situation with event bridge, I'm just going to put EB. Event bridge can actually check the value in the message itself. So for the same situation, event bridge, you can say, oh, type is home insurance. Then event bridge can directly invoke Lambda 1. If the type is car insurance, then event bridge can invoke another Lambda, let's say Lambda 2. And if it is, let's say, motorcycle insurance, it can call Lambda 3. Uh, next thing is, SQS cannot transform the message. So whatever system A puts in, system B will get the same message. But 
event bridge can actually change the message because event bridge discovers the schema of the message event bridge will have this mapping automatically that a type is of type string so you have uh, you can manipulate the message a little bit so if you want to uh, let's say uh, change a value in the message event bridge can do that sqs cannot do that and the third thing is um, messages can be archived in event bridge so let's say you are creating a new system uh, so system a you are testing it sending a message and this lambda fails okay so something is wrong with the code and then you fix the lambda and you want to retest it system a needs to resend the same message again and then maybe the lambda failed again then you fixed again so you have to so the system a need to keep resending those messages with even bridge messages can be saved so let's say the message one i'm going to put it as m1 came to even bridge m1 can be archived in even bridge free of charge and this time also let's say some lambda failed you fixed it and you can replay this message and the system a don't need to resend the message so this is very handy and you can selectively archive messages based on criteria. So you could say only uh, save the messages where the type is uh, home insurance. And then you just replay those. But SQS, uh, going back, I know the question is uh, why use even bridge when SQS is cheaper. Um, but alternatively, SQS also has some superpower. SQS has way more scalability than even bridge. Uh, so look up the quotas of even bridge um, so it's it's like a finite number but sqs can scale nearly unlimited uh, so if it's just a simple uh, me system a sending messages to system b uh, that's it then use sqs but if you need this functionalities and if it can reduce some of your coding layer then use even bridge even bridge also helps you code uh, since EventBridge discovers the schema of the message, you can download the schema and EventBridge gives you some code as well. So in the, in the Lambda, you can use those uh, to um, read those messages and process those messages. Uh, so the, I get this question a lot that Raj, uh, in, let's say instead of SNS, SQS, you use SNS and uh, SNS can also do uh, filtering based on message. So don't get confused, SNS can only do filtering based on the metadata of the message, not the actual value inside the message. So when a message comes, you can attach some metadata. And reading this metadata, SNS can push to different uh, targets, uh, but even bridge can actually read inside the message. Uh, so SNS cannot do that. All right, so that's how you answer this question. Next question, uh, should I choose serverless or Kubernetes? Uh, so this is a very elaborate uh, question. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna point to a video where I went over serverless versus uh, container and you can take a look and then answer based on that. Also, I highly recommend you to watch that because this question is becoming very common uh, because now a container is getting very popular uh, serverless also is like very attractive because of its features uh, so please take a look if you are going for solutions architect interviews next question uh, how can you migrate your existing apis to amazon api gateway uh, so this question can be applicable to other apis as well so let's say you are using uh, apg or mulesoft and the question could be how can you migrate apis from api gateway to apg mulesoft or vice versa so API Gateway and other big API platforms, um, APG, MuleSoft, they all support Open API version 3. So what it allows you to do is export the APIs as a Swagger file. So you can think Swagger as like infrastructure as code for APIs. Uh, so if you have API defined in APG, you can export the Open API spec in a Swagger file and you can import that Swagger file in API Gateway that will define your basic structure of the API. Uh, and then you can just hook up the different backends. If you are going to use Lambda, you can do that integration piece. But similarly, 
uh, if you have an API running uh, in API Gateway in one AWS account, and you want to define the same API in other AWS accounts, uh, you can export that API using Swagger plus API Gateway extensions. So basically, um, when you export something from Apigee, Apigee does not have uh, Lambda, right? Uh, API Gateway can integrate with Lambda uh, much more straightforward way. Uh, so you export the API and that brings the most of the things, but you still need to hook up some of the things with Lambda. But if you are moving from API Gateway in one AWS account to another AWS account, uh, if you export using Swagger along with API Gateway extensions, uh, you can just take that infrastructure as code and migrate it directly. You don't need to change anything. So, but in general, uh, the answer for this question is use Open API Spec version 3 Swagger files to import export from one API platform to another API platform. Next question, how can you use API Gateway with EKS and ECS? So EKS is basically Elastic Kubernetes Service, the Kubernetes managed Kubernetes platform from AWS, and ECS is AWS's own uh, container orchestration system. So let's go over EKS first. Uh, so the way Kubernetes works is, um, Kubernetes exposes the pods using ingress. Uh, if you don't know what ingress is, I'll give a link to a video, study, study the ingress, super important. Pod two, so this is definitely EKS, right? Uh, and then they are exposed using a ingress, which is a load balancer. Since Kubernetes is uh, open source, API Gateway cannot go directly to these pods. It has to go through ingress because ingress is a Kubernetes object. So in this case, what it needs to happen is if I have this API, the API has to go to this application load balancer or network load balancer based on what kind of ingress you have. And then it will go to those EKS pods. Now you might ask, so why, why do you even want to use API Gateway? Uh, because API Gateway has some features uh, such as a message uh, transformation, message validation, like it can validate if certain fields are present in the API payload, uh, and throttling, you can throttle uh, the rate of the messages so I have a separate video on API Gateway versus application load balancer. You can check it out as well. You might want to use API Gateway. Now going back to ECS, so instead of pods, you'll have tasks. Now since ECS is AWS's uh, um, native service, ECS can integrate directly with API. Uh, using Cloud Map. So Cloud Map does the discovery of the tasks and the API Gateway can use that to go directly to ECS. So last question, tell me a challenge you faced with serverless. So whenever someone asks you about a challenge, so the interviewer is also looking for how you solve the challenge. And whenever you face this kind of challenge question, one of the safe way to answer is, is the cost optimization and performance optimization. Because they're always a challenge. Like if you think about EC2 in the early days, everyone will go to EC2 and then they will discover their bill is high and then they have to go optimize it and they have to know how to optimize it. Similarly, with uh, serverless, uh, you could say that, yeah, we, we uh, uh, provisioned a bunch of lambdas we used up, uh, we allocated a huge number of memory. You could say maybe five gigabyte, 10 gigabyte or maximum memory available. And then um, we, we, we noticed that we are paying a lot more than we should have. Um, so how do you solve this? You solve this by looking at the metrics. Uh, so uh, AWS has this service called CloudWatch and CloudWatch Insights uh, tells you how much memory is allocated in the Lambda and how much is actually getting used. So you could say that we overcame the challenge by looking at the uh, CloudWatch Insights uh, and then we reduce the memory because Lambda gets charged based on the amount of memory allocated, not used, and the duration of the function. Uh, and there are some tools you could say that uh, you ran a Lambda Power Tuner. This is a tool which takes your Lambda uh, puts it in a step functions and then it increases the memory uh, a little bit every time and then it, it tests your lambda and gives you a graph between the cost 
as well as the execution time. And using that, you can determine the optimal amount of memory you need for your Lambda. And the other thing you could do is, you can always refer back to the cold start question that we discussed. Um, you could say that when we moved or testing our code with Lambda, we noticed that the cold start is higher outside of the SLA for our application. Uh, so what we did was we took this uh, number one, number two, number three measures to uh, reduce cold start. So check out the cold start um, question answer and use those to answer this question. All right, so those are some of the challenges uh, you can mention. If you want to know more about serverless, Kubernetes, system design, infrastructures, code, Git, GitHub, check out my highest rated and best selling courses on Udemy. All my courses are on maximum discount for next four days. And all my courses comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. If you don't like the content of the course, you get your money back, no questions asked. With that, please like this video, click subscribe. Let me know what other kind of interview questions you want me to cover. All right, folks, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next video.